Welcome to season two of Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. Adrian Fries and Trey Bailey invite you to join them on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as we participate in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. So I'm here with Mrs. Autumn Kern, and Autumn is the hostess of the Commonplace podcast, as well as the Commonplace YouTube channel. And what I think I'd like to do is, is just read her own words from the, bio, from the biography uh, that she has posted on her website, thecommonplacepodcast.com. And I think this will be a good opener to uh, what I expect to be a really uh, wonderful conversation. So here, Autumn describes herself as a wife, mother, and a keeper of an actual commonplace book. When she was 21, she sat under the tree with a man who told her the woman he married would homeschool his children. Handsome as he was, she didn't anticipate being that woman. But here she is, with three little ones in tow, and as in all of God's providential ways, it has been the greatest gift. After talking at length for years about classical education to anyone who would listen, and possibly some who wouldn't, she was interrupted by the aforementioned man who encouraged her to hit record. And I'm grateful that this mystery man, who I hope we will learn about more uh, in the conversation to follow, I encouraged her to hit record because I discovered Autumn's work through her podcast and the YouTube channel. And as a classical educator myself and someone who is sort of uh, charging into the fray as a new homeschool dad, uh, looking forward to applying Charlotte Mason's principles and practices, uh, finding Autumn's work was really a breath of fresh air. And so I'm, I'm uh, eager to have this conversation and I'd like to welcome you, Autumn, to the to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. And we've got a great lineup of questions here, but before we delve into them, I think we need to hear a little bit more about this story, about this, this fateful day under the tree with this mystery man. But before we get there, maybe you can back us up all the way to your early childhood and just tell us your story. Just take us back to uh, your earliest memories um, as a schoolgirl and sort of um, how God basically took you from growing up to the place you are now, where you're not only a homeschool mom, but also someone who is seeking to help other homeschoolers. Sure. So I was someone who always loved school. Going to buy school supplies was the height of my summer, spending hours on my bed, reorganizing them over and over again, just preparing for the first day of school was my idea of a good time. So I've always loved school. I primarily went to public school, K through 12, had a couple years in and out of prep schools, but primarily did the public school all the way through. And as I looked towards college, I knew that I probably wanted to do something with history or political science. And so in that point, um, God did bring a family who introduced me to Grove City College, which is where I ended up going. And I ended up studying history there. And that was my first taste of education without utilitarian angle. I had always gone to school looking to get the 4.0 or the straight A's, do exactly what I needed to do in order to get my grade. But when I met with the professors that I had in the history department and in other areas when I took some electives, I found that there was an entire world of study that was not utilitarian in nature, but was actually supposed to do something to me by me studying the past. And I loved it. And I didn't know at that point that I was creeping towards the classical world. I had no idea. I just loved good stories. I loved learning from them. And I loved my studies. I also, while at Grove City, met that handsome man. His name is Josh. And we now have three children. But that fateful September day, we were sitting outside of a beautiful old building. Grove City is full of them. It's very picturesque. And we had been spending some time together. And he felt the need to let me know of his very strong conviction about homeschooling. He had been homeschooled his whole entire life. He's one of five and loved it. He already could see how it knit his family together, how they had a wonderful experience together, how much he enjoyed learning. Um, he is a unique person in the world for how much he loves just learning things for no end goal, just to know, like just to learn and to be changed. And so I thought at that point that that was an interesting idea. 
I had no intention to homeschool any children. I was going to go to graduate school and do other things, but he was very handsome. And so I thought we could at least put a pin in it and come back to it later. And so we got engaged pretty quickly when you know, you know, sort of thing. And um, the more time I spent with his family as we approached getting married and everything, the more I just fell in love with the Kearns and their family culture and hearing their stories. And so I was getting warmer and warmer towards homeschooling uh, with each passing month. And so we did get married a couple years later, we were expecting our first. And that is when I started my homeschool journey. It's when I started doing my research. Now, that, that's such an intriguing story, because I, I have to admire his, his courage and his uh, commitment to um, his belief in homeschooling. And as the uh, quote unquote product of being homeschooled, I was homeschooled myself. And um, I love to meet other homeschoolers. Uh, one of the things we, we always enjoy um, saying to one another is, hey, hey, look, you know, we, we turned out, you know, pretty normal. And, and we, we survived. Um, and it's fun being in conversation with my parents, because um, when I was homeschooled, and, and I, I would presume that uh, your husband and I are relatively around the same age, um, you know, homeschooling was, was not necessarily popular. I mean, depending on where you lived, in some places, I'm pretty sure it was illegal, or at least it had only recently been legalized. And so it was kind of like the Wild West. And you know, my mother um, really had to kind of pull things together for herself and just, it was kind of a hodgepodge of things. And, you know, um, I think at some point she ordered like an actual box curriculum, but mm -hmm. there was a, there was a lot of our schooling that was clearly of her own making and, you know, it helped that she had, you know, spent a life in, um, in church and, and teaching Sunday school and creating curriculum for that. And so she was able to to do that to the best of her ability. But anymore, you can look out and and see that there's just a, a world of resources for homeschool uh, mothers and fathers. And on the one hand, that's delightful. But on the other hand, I would imagine it's, well, I know from firsthand experience that it's also kind of overwhelming. And so someone like you uh, who is speaking directly to people interested in classical education and Charlotte Mason, I think it's helpful because you kind of help narrow things down. And, and not only do you speak directly to principles and, and the philosophy of it all, but also you, you give a lot of practical advice. So I imagine we'll hear both from you today, which I'm eager for. And if Adrian was here, um, she would be excited that we're going to make sure, um, Adrian's here in spirit. She's going to make sure we talk about practical tips for homeschoolers. Um, but I, I'm curious. So back to that that September uh, that September day. So what was your gut reaction, if if you remember? I mean, to say uh, to have that commitment in advance that you're going to homeschool um, was that um, exhilarating, exciting? Were you, were you scared? I mean, was it a mix of emotions? If to the best of your your memory, what was your gut reaction? Oh, that's a good question. On that particular September day, I don't think I felt anything because I didn't think I'd be doing it. Like I, we were very recent buddies, if you will. And while we enjoyed our conversations and we would go for walks, we lived like Grove City is in a very lovely wooded natural area, lots of pretty places to explore. I didn't know exactly where things were going. And so I can't say that I had any feelings other than, well, I am going to graduate school. And so I suppose children would be down the road and we could get to that when we get to that. Um, but I did know that Josh Kern was one of the most fascinating people I'd ever met. Yeah. He thought differently than other people and he yeah. was very principled. He was not easily swayed. Right. And he had a certain... There was a certain thing that I couldn't quite put my finger on then, but now that I know all of his brothers and his sister and his family, I know much of it came from being educated, like you said, by renegades. My mother-in-law, I adore her, and she did not have any access to the resources that we have now. And she just had a commitment to what essentially was providing truth, goodness, and beauty to your kids without having the lingo for it. Right. And she just kept working year after year as best as she could to find those things and to bring them to them. And I could see the fruit of that in... Josh already then, but also his family as I got to know them. And so as I continued to, to learn about him and to care for him, I got more and more excited about it, knowing mm. that building a home life, building a family life was very important to me. I knew that's what I wanted to do. And so investing in that way and actually educating our children, which is the continuation of what mothers are doing in the early years, just in a slightly different format and fathers as well. Um, and I, I just continued to go more excited in those early years before we actually started having our children. 
Well, it, it sounds like I need to have this guy on the show sometime. And we've thought about doing family episodes, which I think would be a lot of fun. But he sounds like a man who knows what he wants. Um, not only is he saying essentially to you, hey, I'm going to marry you, by the way. Right. And and also you're going to homeschool my kids. But, um, you know, to, to be someone, as you described, principled and um, and really sort of has a plan for the future. I think that's important, especially when we are up against just so many challenges in the world of education and families look out at the schools and they they intuitively know that what they want in their heart of hearts is not on offer. Mm -hmm. And so it takes a lot of courage to then say, okay, well, I'm gonna have to figure this out. And it is good that people like you are are putting content out there and providing resources. And, and that's what we're trying to do is be an encouragement to um, homeschoolers, but also classroom teachers, school administrators, people who are out there in the trenches, so to speak. And a lot of these people, ourselves included, did not receive a classical education um, or we received something um, that was trying to get back to the sources, but having to kind of pull from a lot of different places. And and one of my early conversations on the show was with Dr. Lou Marcos. And, and I don't know if he said this in the interview or off air, but... Um, he he said that God must have a, a sense of humor because, you know, he chose homeschool mothers primarily to essentially be the stewards of, you know, these these great works and these things that are being jettisoned from the schools, things that, you know, used to be read um, in the halls of ac academia, let's say, and now are, are largely read just in, in people's living rooms, um, which is a sad testament to the state of education. but. I'm really encouraging for people who are who are looking to um, reclaim their God-given um, mandate to to teach their children and be the the first to do that and the primary educators. So, um, okay, let's 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 get into the the questions here. So, we've mentioned classical education and we've mentioned Charlotte Mason, and what I'd love for you to help us do together is figure out how those two fit together. Um, in other words, help me place Charlotte Mason within the classical tradition as you read her and as you've sort of come to know her. Sure. So I think you were right that people feel very overwhelmed with the amount of resources that we have when they set out to understand exactly how to homeschool. I know I did. In fact, when I found out that I was expecting our first, and I was like, well, now is the time. I'm supposed to figure out how to do this. I think I probably Googled how to homeschool, and I was totally unprepared for how many educational philosophies exist, how many people are talking about them, how many people are saying this is the only right way, these are the things you need, so on and so on. And so to bring a slight bit of humor to it, which is my go-to, I decided to Google quiz to find out what type of homeschooling mom you are. And that actually does exist. You can take it. I bet you could take it, a homeschooling dad quiz. And in doing that, though, I... I, gave, I was given two responses. My top was a, class, a classical educator and my second was a Charlotte Mason educator. And they appeared to be two different things to me. And when I first started to Google them, I realized, at least from Instagram and Pinterest, that Charlotte Mason was about being outside and watercoloring in your nature journal. And I'm not a very good painter, so I just flopped back over to classical and thought I would check that out. And I fell in, like many people do, through Dorothy Sayers, The Lost Tools of Learning. And while I didn't totally know everything she was talking about, I could tell that she was onto something. And like we were talking about before we started recording, I studied history. And so I became a good footnotes chaser. I just kept following the footnotes back through, through writers, back through educational philosophers until eventually I ended up at Plato. And that didn't just happen over the course of a week. This was about three and a half years worth of trying to learn and understand this broad, beautiful framework of education. Because as I kept going deeper, I started to see a deeper and richer definition emerge of what classical education was. And so I think that three years was actually very necessary for me before I started reading Mason in order for me to find where she fit in, because I was already coming to her with a pretty rich understanding, still very new. Three and a half years is not long in a classical tradition at all. I am no expert, but I was familiar enough with the idea of, and I'm going to steal this from the Circe Institute. I love their definition for classical education. The idea of um, cultivating virtue and wisdom by nourishing a soul on truth, goodness, and beauty with the seven liberal arts and the four sciences so that in Christ, a child may love and enjoy God. That's pretty much what they say. And I've, I've always thought that captures the spirit of the tradition. And so when I was able to take that and I looped back around to Mason because I started learning from a woman named Brandy Vensel who loves Charlotte Mason and loves the classical tradition. And so 
she was the first person I actually heard talking about Mason within the tradition. And I thought I really should return to that Charlotte Mason and see maybe what's going on there because it's gotta be more than Instagram photos. It's gotta be deeper than that. And so when I, when I flipped into Mason and I started looking at her 20 principles, I realized that the thing about Mason is that when she writes, she doesn't footnote. She doesn't tell you what she's quoting from. She will say things like, I'm an educational progressive. I'm moving things forward. I wanna change things but everything she's pulling from, you, everything's probably not fair. Most of the things she's pulling from are old. She's actually pulling from the great classical educators that I had been reading from the classical tradition. She's pulling from Aristotle. She's pulling from Quintilian. She's pulling from St. Basil. Mm -hmm. She's just not telling you that she's doing it. But Mason would vehemently agree with the idea of cultivating virtue and wisdom, this moral formation being the point of an education. She is very interesting in her time and place. She was a Victorian English woman. She's writing late 1800s, early 1900s. She, you know, lives through World War I. She sees a lot of things start to change in the educational world. And she's shocked by a lot of it, but she has the unique perspective of seeing the first generation to come out of some of these major shifts that we're actually still downstream from and still using in our modern education now. Things like the Herbardian model, like a mind bucket philosophy, seeing education as utilitarian. Um, thinking about my childhood, I grew up always hearing you go to school to get a job, you go to school to go to college to get a job to make money like that's why you go and learn stuff like that that idea has deep roots just you know 100 200 years ago and so Mason, when she's writing, when she starts to dig in about how she wants to be a progressive and change things, it's because she's very alarmed at what she sees. She actually describes the generation coming out of schools at that point in England as wounded spiritually, emotionally, and intellectually. And what she means by that is not that they weren't able to act in society, that they couldn't get jobs and work, but that the things they love are not worth loving, that the things they pursue are not long lasting, that they don't, they have no rootedness in what is like deep wisdom of the past. And so there are many ways that you can start to connect Mason in. And I think there are people who have done it very well, thinking about her introduction of synthetic knowledge before analytic knowledge, giving the whole of an idea to a child before breaking it apart. Those are some of the big ways people start to connect her. But as I was thinking about preparing for this interview, what I the one I want to pick on actually is a principle. It's her fourth principle, because I think that it's kind of a quirky way to start mm. tying her in, but it actually gets to the heartbeat of education as understood in the classical tradition. And so if you don't know Mason, all of her principles need to be understood within context of one another. So by the time she gets to her fourth, basically what she's laid out is that children are born full persons. It means that they're complete. They have what they need to grow if they are fed properly. And that means physically or intellectually. So she goes on that. She moves into that children are not born either good or bad. And of course, that sends off all the theological alarm bells for people, but she is talking about character. In Victorian England, in the late 1800s, character was something that was sort of like genetics. They thought if your parents had blue eyes, you might have blue eyes. If your dad was a liar, you were probably going to be a liar. So she's pushing back in that second principle that children can grow in virtue. They can learn to love goodness. Um, and then she gets to her third principle, which is about authority and docility. And she's saying that within the homeschool, within the classroom, this must exist in order for a child to learn. But then uh, she, she says in her fourth principle, and this is the, the main one I want to talk about, is that that authority that you hold is held it's held by the respect due to a child's personality. There's actually a check on that authority that you have. And what she means by personality is not a child's Enneagram number. Like that's not what she means. She means their character or their will. And this will is very important for Mason. She's constantly talking about habit training, setting the atmosphere and bringing living ideas in order to help a child form a strong will towards what's good. And so when Mason talks about the reason for why a child should do anything, she pulls from Ephesians 6.1 and says the apostolic injunction for a child is that because it's right. The first part of that is that children should obey their parents and the Lord for it is right. And she says that you can use nothing else to motivate a child to do anything else other than for it is right. She goes through love. She goes through fear, influence, suggestion, any play on any desire is wrong because ultimately what you motivate a child with is what you motivate them towards. Mm. And so you could handicap a child unintentionally usually, right? Like most moms are not trying to handicap their children by manipulating them, but it's a lot easier to get a child to do what you want by maybe suggesting something here or maybe leaving the consequence that's not natural is a bit of fear for the child. But Mason continues to just hammer this point home that a child must grow a strong will, a will towards what's good. She points out that in Paradise Lost, Satan has a very strong will. 
it's not towards goodness though. So you actually have to train a will towards what's good. Lewis would call this just sentiments. There are a lot of ways to talk about this, but I think this point is my favorite that connects her to the classical tradition, because ultimately she's talking about the groundwork for virtue. You cannot become a virtuous person, someone who, to steal from David Hicks, knows what is good, loves what is good, and reproduces it, if you do not have a will that can push against everything else pulling you away from that towards what's good. And in this, you start to hear echoes of, I mean, you have David Hicks, if you work backwards, you have C.S. Lewis with his just sentiments, you keep going, you have St. Augustine with his Ordo Amoris, that we're mm -hmm. learning to love the right things in the right way at the right time. You keep going back and you get to Quintilian and the expectation of virtue starting from the nursery years and being the only thing that a child is introduced to throughout their life, because going to Aristotle, habits are not easy. Habits are hard. The habitual practice of choosing what's good, which is what Mason is getting at, is actually a, a real struggle for all of us throughout the course of our life. And as we hope to eventually gain pleasure from being virtuous people for doing what is right, it starts in the early years. It starts with what you're motivating a child with. And so Mason puts this huge fence around what then do we have as our instruments of education, our instruments as mothers in the formation of our children, and she keeps it simple. You have your atmosphere, your discipline of habits, and your introduction of living ideas, which is itself the classical tradition, truth, goodness, and beauty as understood through story, because we are people made for story. And I think that's the heartbeat of the tradition. If you if you ask people, there's differing definitions for classical ed. That's part of the difficulty in this conversation is not everyone agrees on the exact same definition. But if you take that broad spirit, Mason just slides right in from the very beginning with kids younger than six. That's what she's talking about. Well, you said it. I mean, I, I think you're I think you're right on. And there is, um, as you say, um, oftentimes when, when you hear Mason in the classical tradition or classical education, let's say, mentioned in the same sentence, um, you know, people can sort of start to back into corners and sort of um, uh, maybe enter into some disagreement. But the way you laid it out, I think, you know, at least to my ears, I mean, is is a very clear um, and, um, you know, you provided a lot of evidence that just shows that Miss Mason is is on the same project that any other truth seeker. And and part of the part of the tradition and, and classical Christian educators, you know, we'll take truth wherever we find it, right? right. It's kind of the idea. Um, that's why we read these pagans, and that's why we will go out and we will seek out uh, books um, that, you know, as, as long as they're living books, as Mason would say, or books that are um, true to life and that are that are rich uh, in in connecting you back to the sources of truth, goodness, and beauty. And you know, this this idea of these um, transcendentals, um, I think really what we're trying to say there is that in the pursuit of truth, if truth really exists and if reality is really real, then there are going to be multiple attestations of people finding it mm. and they will all affirm one another. And yes. whether you profess to be a quote unquote classical educator, or if that's not even in your vocabulary, it really doesn't matter because you're all aiming at the same thing. Um, but as we can look back in hindsight and see how these people were, um, it, it's kind of fun to, to start to draw the connections as you so beautifully did. And anything that Mason would say about, um, you know, claims to um, be a progressive, I think we could we could very rightly read that um, in sort of the the way I've always understood through the classical tradition to think about progress, which is a moving forward into the future, which we we have to do right, just as a matter of existing. But we we do that as human beings, as creatures who look backwards. We move in. We move backwards into the future because the only thing we have in front of us to to think about is the past. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's that's a fascinating concept in and of itself. And then, um, of course, dealing with the present means being in conversation with um, contemporary science, contemporary philosophers, theorists, right? Which Mason was, mm -hmm. but to always um, put that to the test and to say, okay, well, does this rhyme with reality as it's been um, proven out and handed down to us, um, passed on? So so any idea that the Mason wasn't concerned with the past, I think is, I actually had someone tell me that. I'm just going to go ahead and put really? this out there. 
that someone told me very, very flatly that, that Mason was not concerned about anything that came from the past. She was concerned about the children in front of her and, um, and, and developing her own theory of education. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really have much to say in response to that because it's so patently false. And also as someone who is, um, I'm not meaning to sound like antagonistic, but it's, it's kind of silly because even someone who would want to devote him or herself to Mason as an educator and as someone you'd want to follow, a philosopher that you'd want to follow. I mean, it's kind of ironic that you would say, well, she didn't care about anything came from the past, but I'm going to commit myself to this Victorian educator. Like it, just, right. so, it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. What I, can, I, can I jump on that? Please. I think that's so interesting because Mason actually talks about when you see a repeated idea throughout history, it has the mark of authenticity. Like that's one of her phrases. She, she loves looking for that. And as a devout Anglican, when she's thinking about transcendentals, right? These are things from God. The God is truth, goodness, and beauty. How could you not work all the way back in the pursuit of what St. Basil says, like being charitable, looking for it wherever you can. And she does that. But like I said, she doesn't footnote. She doesn't tell you that she's quoting. And she's also in a time and place. And a lot of times with educational writers, philosophers, they are pushing back on what they see. Like Mason doesn't talk too much about mathematics, right? So people can kind of the idea that a Mason education is just reading books and frolicking around in a field. But no, she actually had the standard of excellence in across her timetable, across every subject, which of course included mathematics, the four sciences, or the quadrivium before the four sciences. But she she doesn't necessarily spend all her time there because the problems that she could see that she was trying to course correct, that she was trying to move forward in, yes, in certain ways, were the problems of the day for her. And so she was looking at this excess of terrible children's literature that was coming onto the market. She was looking at what's happening in schools because of the introduction of Herbart or what happened in World War I. She was floored with the idea of German utilitarianism across all of life. I mean, she was writing in response to things that were happening and shaping England at that time. And of course, the students in front of her, but it wasn't because she had no interest in what happened in the past. It was because she was actually just responding in part to like, here's why I'm changing this. This is why the PNU schools are doing things this way, um, just like any of us would. But I love what you said that she she thought about science at the time. I loved reading when she's talking about habits. She talks about like the neural pathways being formed in the mind. This is a very new idea at that point. People didn't realize that the habits you run actually change the structure of your mind, like your brain. But Mason heard that, and that made sense to her because of what she had learned in church about the things you repeatedly do doing something to you. And so she's always connecting in, like your point, that she would take something new and find it rooted in something old and steadfast. And then there were other things that she would mention, like, oh, this seems like a nice idea. We'll see how it goes. So she, she wasn't a progressive in that sense of just going forward is the merit therein. Right. Yes. Way to go. (laughs) No, I, I think I think you're you're exactly right, and this this really just fits very well with two very recent conversations that I've had. That um, if they're not already on the air, they they will be at some point, and so just stay tuned, I guess. But I had a conversation with Jason Barney, who has done a lot of work, and he's like you, uh, deep in the literature, and has some great blog posts up on um, uh, narration in particular, but also thinking about Mason within the classical tradition. And then um, I had a I had a wonderful conversation with um, uh, uh, Margarita Muni Suarez, and she she's up in Princeton at the seminary there, and she heads up. Oh, I'm, I wish I could remember. I have to put it in the show notes the organization that she that she runs. Um, but she is reading a lot in um, educational philosophy and just showing us how we are tasting the fruit of of this philosophy primarily coming up through Dewey, who, you know, John Dewey's just had a massive influence on American education in particular, and America's had a, an influence on the world. Um, but he was borrowing, as as you said, from from the Germans and the Prussians, and and then, you know, his ties to Rousseau and sort of, here we go, we're getting into the philosophy. All the good stuff. Um, <laughs> which is worth pursuing. So I guess what I should say is um, perhaps we'll have a bonus episode where I talk to Autumn more about philosophy. Um, and also go listen to my conversation with Margarita Muni Suarez, where she really delves into um, the classical tradition from a Catholic perspective and starts to show how there are some some really wonderful works of um, uh, educational philosophy written by Catholics that we're going up against. So here we have Mason and Anglican. Somehow Christians are coming together from these ancient traditions and saying, wait a minute these philosophies of education do not rhyme with reality. They're not true. Mm-hmm. And um, 
And the source of truth comes from tradition because it, tradition rightly thought of, um, actually, if you back it up far enough, actually comes from the hand of God, mm -hmm. the source of all truth, goodness, and beauty. So very much like a ray comes from the sun. Uh, so we can follow the thread of tradition back to, back to God and his, and his eternal word. So now I'm preaching. So this is great. We're doing philosophy and it. I'm preaching. <laughs> um, oh, should I do this? I think I have, I have a kind of beefy quote from Mason do it. that I, I was really delighted to find because, um, you know, I've heard a lot of people say that um, the idea of classical education, even that term didn't exist during her period, which I'm, I'm, I'm open to um, any corrections about that, and I'm not deep in the literature enough to know if that's a true claim or not. But then I discovered this one passage from uh, her volume, Formation of Character. And if you don't mind me just reading the quote, I'll, I'll read it directly. So Mason says, quote, if people are to live in order to get rich rather than, than to enjoy satisfaction and living, they can do very well without intellectual culture. But if we are to make the most of life as the days go on, then it is a duty to put this power of getting enjoyment into the hands of the young. They must be educated up to it. Some children, by right of descent, take to books as ducks to water. But delight in fine thought, well set, does not come by nature. Moreover, it is not the sort of thing that the training of the schools commonly aims at, to turn out men and women with enough exact knowledge for the occasion of life and with wits on the alert for chances of promotion, that is what most schools pretend to, and indeed do accomplish. The contention of scholars is that a classical education does more, turns out men with intellects cultivated and trained, who are awake to every refinement of thought and yet ready for action. But the press and the hurry of our times and the clamor for useful knowledge are driving classical culture out of the field and parents will have to make up their minds not only that they must supplement the moral training of the school, but must supply the intellectual culture, without which knowledge may be power, but is not pleasure, nor the means of pleasure. Mm. End quote. I mean, there it is. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I guess praise God that, uh, you know, um, Mason, who delights us in all her many ways, um, is drawing from some pretty deep wells. And I, and I guess maybe we could just leave it at that. Yeah, I agree. She definitely does. Wonderful. So you mentioned someone, and and I, I jotted down her name here, um, Brandy uh, Vinsel. Is that right? Oh, yes. I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about her and any other uh, practitioners of Charlotte Mason's work that you have uh, drawn from or are encouraged by. And these can be either contemporaries or people from the past. Oh, okay, yeah. So Brittany Vinsel is, um, she is the writer over at Afterthoughts. That is her blog. She has been writing for either 10 or 15 years, I guess at least 15 years, because she started writing about Charlotte Mason when her oldest was young, before he started formal school. And he has since graduated and she's about to graduate her second, I think after this year. And so she has been writing about applying Mason's philosophy about her pedagogy and the larger classical tradition for an entire child going through school, which is amazing because a lot of times you run into questions like, well, what about the later years? What about high school years? She has stuff there. Um, she also hosts a podcast called School Lay Sisters, which is a conversation between usually two to four women, depends on who's on that day. But um, some of them are, they would say purely classical, some lean Charlotte Mason, some see the, the tie between the two like Brandy does. And that's a wonderful like current resource for people. Um, a couple other people, I know that you've had Karen Glass on the show um, and that she is a part of everything over here at Classical Education. Um, her books are tremendous, any of, any of them. Excellent things to read. Uh, if you see her on any sort of podcast interview, just click it and listen. Um, she's very wise, as well as finding Mason in that larger tradition. I'm always delighted by her insights. And then lastly, one of my favorite places that I'll pop over to is the Searcy Institute. Um, they are run by a family of Kearns. I am not one of those Kearns, but I would love to go to dinner with all of them. They are run by Andrew Kern. I think he has a gracious and beautiful vision for classical education um, and how you can implement it both in the classroom and at home. There's a resource there for everyone. And um, there also, there is someone named Heidi White and she has lovely seminars, webinars, things like that in which she dives into how classical education can heal the soul. 
And she's actually, I think, writing a book about a similar idea right now. And I would highly recommend anything from her as well. I've learned from all of them a great deal. Ah, well, those are all wonderful recommendations. And you're right. Um, uh, Karen Glass is someone who has uh, joined um, our group of consultants. And so I encourage people to listen to her conversation where we just had a very, um, very open conversation about questions. And, and she was exploring something that she hadn't been able to talk about publicly. And she doesn't, as a lot of people know, she doesn't do a lot of interviews, but increasingly she's been open to the idea of um, offering seminars on her on her books. And so we have one up and running. Um, and I guess at the time of this, uh, the publishing of this conversation, you'll just have to check the website to see what's available. But um, ideally we hope to have um, Karen doing a lot more things like that. And she will book out a class very quickly. She has a long standing um, following, I guess, of, of homeschool moms in particular. And one of the things I'm hoping for um, with finding your work and kind of uh, coming across a few other people who are, let's say, um, up and coming um, in their uh, public life, anyhow, talking about classical education, Charlotte Mason, to put all of you in conversation and um, to really, I think, give um, a lot of encouragement to moms who have been doing this for a long time, or maybe who are now even grandmothers who are encouraging their um, children to homeschool in this way. Um, and for them to see younger moms stepping up and carrying on the tradition, but then also for, uh, for perhaps some of your audience who are new to this, um, to, to just draw from those, those deep wells that, um, that people like Glass and others have already dug for us. I keep going to the well image. I think I'm thirsty. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> I guess it always makes me thirsty as well. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's see, what else could we do together here? We're going to have to have a part two because we spent so much time talking before I hit record that I'm at risk of keeping you up too late and <laughs> keeping you away from your 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 charming husband and kids who are hopefully asleep by now, I would presume. They are, thankfully. Um, <clears throat> so let's do this. Um, what would be, speaking of encouragement, what words of encouragement do you have for homeschool parents who are, um, I guess, um, either just starting out the journey or are relatively new to um, the world of Charlotte Mason and classical education? Yeah, I think that the common thing that I hear from people is that when they fall in love with the idea of a classical Charlotte Mason education, whether at home or in a cottage school or something, it's so lovely, but they feel like it just couldn't possibly be for them. They haven't been classically educated. They don't want to read Boethius on a Tuesday night. They don't even like to listen to Bach that much. And so while it seems beautiful and it seems lovely, it just can't be for them. And that's kind of the common refrain that I hear and kind of why I'm always speaking to the moms who are at that starting line to help them kind of bridge that gap over to the great resources that already exist. That they just need a little bit of help getting to. Um, the thing is that this is about learning how to live. A classical education is a humanizing thing, both for the mother teacher and for the kids around the table. You're actually coming into contact with living ideas of truth, goodness, and beauty in a way that will form your mind and your soul. And that is for all of you. What you actually need is not to be the expert. You don't need to have all the answers. Mason calls the mother teacher the philosopher, guide, and friend. And those are things that moms are doing from day one. We're always growing in those skills and in the ability to do those jobs well, but what they take, that's humility, that's curiosity, that's an enjoyment of God's world and a desire to learn alongside of our children. So in that respect, this is an education for every child, for every mom, for every home. Um, there, there's no one, no person that this is not fit for. And so what I think is helpful though, is to actually read Mason for herself it is very easy to hop on and listen to podcasts or read articles or hop on Instagram and get a sound bite and never actually face Mason herself. I think about C.S. Lewis in his um, introduction to St. Athanasius's book. He talks about meeting the greats face to face and that there should be a little bit of trembling, but it's to us that they want to speak. And I think of Mason similarly, like, yes, Victorian English is kind of, you got to get used to it. It's a little bit weird. She's rambling. She doesn't use punctuation very often, but 
you can get a hold of Mason and you need to, because Mason needs to be understood in context. Getting your Mason sound bites from somewhere like Instagram is just going to harm your homeschool and it's going to set you up to fail. Because what I've learned is that we are materialists in our modern world. We think that materials are the primary, most important thing when we set out on any endeavor, including home education. We think we need to buy all the right things to have the right homeschool. And while the material cause, as we understand from Aristotle, is important, there are three other three other causes. There are three other things going on. And getting your philosophy and pedagogy, if you just focus there slowly, tick by tick, bit by bit, that is what's going to actually form your home and equip you to be able to lay this feast before your children and to enjoy it with them. Um, and what I also love about this is that Mason is not a singular voice. This is actually why I like trying to find where she is in the classical tradition. I personally would be very worried of following one person as if they were an errant. Um, and so when you can find, as Mason calls them, those marks of authenticity, continue to search for the things she says farther back in history, then you'll have this very sure footing that you're standing on wisdom that has been earned, protected, and passed on. And you're not starting from scratch. You as the mom or you as the dad at the table who feels like you don't know these things, you're not starting from ground zero and figuring it out alone. You're actually inheriting something and then passing it on to your children. And when you catch that larger vision, I think you have the comfort of being equipped by others, but also the exciting part of sharing it and passing it on to the next generation. I think that's that's good advice, and I'm I'm listening to every word of it because, as I think I mentioned, I am uh, starting a new venture in my life, uh, that of a homeschooling father, and so I've taught in uh, classical Christian education um, for the last few years, and thought that I had sort of figured out. I had, let's 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 be frank. I'd finally just begun to figure out what it would be like to be in front of a a classroom of students. And then making the decision with my wife that um, moving forward as we welcome our fourth child and my wife, who's a speech language pathologist and has a pretty sweet setup that she's, you know, she's, she's a smart one. She's worked for the same people for the last, you know, 14 years. So, you know, she's, <laughs> she's got a, she's got a, um, uh, something that she wants to continue. And so we're doing something that's really different and really sort of bizarre. And as I was talking with you before the show, you know, I'm, I'm like a pretty rare bird in the world of homeschooling in general, and even rarer in the world of Charlotte Mason classical education homeschooling. Um, and we did enroll our oldest son, Maverick, in a once one day a week co-op in a in the city over. And it's a Charlotte Mason co-op that I didn't even know existed until I started just, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And so um, sometimes there's people right in your own backyard that are oriented towards the same things and going down the same path. And yeah, I'm the only dad standing out on the lawn, you know, waiting for the kids to get out. And um, I do dress like this most of the time. And obviously, this is a podcast, so I don't know why I'm telling people what I'm wearing. But um, when I would go teach in front of a classroom, I would wear a coat and tie. And so when I take my son to the co-op, I wear a coat and tie. And the moms think that's really weird. Um <laughs> Uh, you know, in their, um, well, never mind. we won't talk about what they're wearing, but um, they're clearly all going directly to the gym afterwards, I have no doubt. <clears throat> so why am I saying all this? I'll help well, you out, Trey. Is your jacket wool? Because if your jacket is wool, then Mason would love it. She has a real thing for wool. In home it, is, it is tweed, and you should be honored that you're the first person for this season that I've broken out the tweed jacket for. Thank so, you. So um, we're... we're I'm this is how bad I want it to be like sweater weather with right. and and autumn colors and all that. Um, so I may be a little bit hot, but uh, your encouragement speaks directly to me because I am having to um, really in a lot of ways start from. You know, ground zero, um, mm -hmm. because, you know, even though I have read Boethius, you know, I've spent time, you know, reading. Aristotle's ethics. And, you know, I, that's, if I had my druthers, I would just sit here in my study and I would be some sort of like strange, you know, monastic type, but no, you know, the children need to be fed and bathed and taken outside. And, and that's one of the encouragements I've gotten from Mason is to get outside more, which Always. is something I love to do with, um, with other guy friends, but turns out going outside with children is, is delightful. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot to be learned from the eyes of a child, not just exploring nature, but reading things that I've never read before, like um, 
Edward Lear's nonsense limericks. My son loves those. And just like any other adult, my first impression of them was, this is total nonsense. <laughs> it says it on the front, right? But they're not nonsense to him. I mean, they are, um, they're just full of things that I don't even perceive. And what I'm not trying to do is make sort some sort of weird sentimental argument about how my son's teaching me more than I'm teaching him. What I'm trying to say is, like, I've never read Edward Lear. I'm getting to read it for the first time with my five-year-old. I've never read most of Beatrix Potter. I'm reading it for the first time with my five and three-year-old. And so, yeah, that's encouragement to say, you know, wherever you're starting, you know, with your kids, this is an opportunity to really almost get a remedial education and get some good things in your life that, you know, maybe you did miss out on, but you can you can enjoy it with them and uh, glean from those uh, just wonderful things that are that are out there. And as you said, you know, they're for everybody. Um, even even Mason's own works, which I put off reading those six volumes for a long time, because even though I'll jump into Dante, like for some reason, this woman <laughs> intimidated me. And then, you know, once I got a pen and um, some paper and sat down with volume one, I just realized that she had a lot to say to my immediate situation, someone who had little children underfoot. Mm -hmm. And, and that was really helpful because um, you could spend a lot of time scrolling, right? Hoping mm -hmm. to come across something that will give you, but then what you usually end up doing is just spending more time scrolling <laughs> mm -hmm. versus sitting down with a book. And I don't know, there's something about that, having that book in hand that when you close it, you actually want to get up and do something about it versus mm -hmm. whatever happens on the internet, which just for me, anyhow, just totally drains me of any desire to do anything <laughs> except, yeah. you know, indulge more. Um, no, I think that's so true. I yeah. wonder too how much when we read, we build a mental image based on the principle at hand. And so then we're like kind of spurred onto meaningful action where particularly, I don't know if this would be true necessarily fathers, but for women, moms on the internet, when they are looking at social media, they get a particular picture as seen in a square maybe. And that yeah. becomes the ideal. And it's someone's particular unique situation with their children, their personalities, their family interests, and they try and copy and paste it onto their life. Wow. And that's why so much of what I talk about is actually understanding the principle, which of course you get when you read Mason, as opposed to trying to take someone's practical application and just make it your own. Because the school room exists the schoolroom exists for your children. Your children don't exist for your schoolroom. You're not shoving them into maybe a picture you've seen while scrolling or yeah. some idea that you've picked up from someone else. You're actually there to serve them. This table, this feast should serve them. And what I love about Mason is she talks about the mental sympathy, which is kind of what you're circling around when you read something with a child for the first time. You're in it with them. You can say, me too. I'm also walking down this path with you. And that's really powerful when you're learning because ultimately what it all comes back to with Mason when she talks about these living ideas and what's a comfort to parents is that living ideas do not die. When you present living ideas to your child, these are the same that have been repeated and studied and loved and treasured by people generation after generation. And ideas, they have very strong verbs, according to Mason. They catch, they seize hold of, they take, they um, cause obsession. Like when she talks about what ideas do in the mind, when you lay an idea before a child, it's the idea in the child's mind getting to work. They're making something personal. They're making it their own. You're doing the same thing, but you're doing it side by side. Mm. And isn't that incredible? These living ideas will bring new life to minds and souls. You're just taking your child's hand and like running through the wardrobe, never to come back. That's what's happening. It's not that you have to have everything or it has to look like what you saw on the internet. It's just you're coming face to face with living things that will produce more life. And that's the great joy, I think, of Mason. Oh, oh it absolutely is. Um, well, uh, Autumn, I'm going to... Uh, beg you to come back on the show because uh, there's much more to talk about here and, and many questions that I didn't get to that um, I would love to be in conversation with you uh, over. Um, maybe to bring our conversation full circle, and if you will forgive me, I would like to pry a little bit more into um, maybe uh, the development of your relationship with your husband after that mandate of you will homeschool my children. Uh, d d does he give you like regular, um, like, uh, reviews like how see how this homeschool is going i mean it, it seems like you really jumped on board with it and you two clearly have a lot in common um not just in terms of your your vision for the good life but it sounds like you probably share a lot of intellectual um interest and and the like 
but if you could speak a little bit more to that and maybe talk about the dynamic between, um, um, if you don't mind sharing personal examples of sort of how you um, work together with your husband to just have this seamless integration between, you know, what you're doing in, in the life of your homeschool with the rest of life. And then also, if you could maybe speak to the the person who's listening, who says, and how should I phrase this? Well, my my husband doesn't really seem to care all that much. He's like, you know, as long as the kids are getting an education, you know, then good. <laughs> or maybe it's the husband who's saying, you know, I wish I could kind of get my wife excited about this a little bit more. And but you know, what do I do? Do I give her six volumes <laughs> and say no, like that is never her homework? Answer. Probably not. <laughs> never the answer. <laughs> so maybe you could give some advice to to a myriad of situations, um, you know, and, and I would imagine that, um, as, um, you know, we, we probably don't want to run the risk of, of sort of depicting your marriage as, as sort of like, it's probably been perfect from day one. Like you said, homeschool them, you homeschool them. And like, I'm sure there was a process of learning how to do this together, figuring it out. So yes, if, as much as you're willing to share. Yeah, no, we're definitely still in that process. It is not completely figured out. I think what we typically find that works for our type of teamwork is that uh, Josh is usually high vision, big plan, and then the practical boots on the ground stuff is me. So as we started, because that's how our life splits, right? Like I am with our children all day. I am the one homeschooling them. He is supporting the homeschool by being gone at work. You know, like it's just a very different situation. Um, and so what what worked for us is I started studying educational philosophies. I would just come in conversation. I really can only speak to wives because the dynamic is different between wives and husbands and husbands and wives, but um, sending a billion books or articles or podcasts to listen to is not always the most loving. It depends on the person that you are married to. Maybe they like doing that once they finish their very long work days, but maybe they don't. And my situation was that that was not loving to just slam my husband with a bunch of homework. It was much better for me to bring things up in conversation. And because I am learning about these wonderful, beautiful things, and he wants what is best for our children. He wants them formed towards God. He wants them to have a rich life of truth, goodness, and beauty. He would never use that phrase. Now he would because he listens to the comments place podcast, but he would not have been using that phrase, you know, six years ago, five years ago. Um, but I could come and be like, this is what I'm learning about. And here's how I'm trying to practice it with the kids. Here's what I tried. Here's what worked. And if something worked, I would always come in conversation to set him up for success. Like this phrasing I'm using, this family liturgy I've formed, this habit training I'm doing is working. And then when it wasn't working, I didn't throw six volumes of Mason at him to be like, figure it out. What am I not getting? It was, hey, can you help me solve this problem? Because actually we are not, we are very similar, but we're also very not similar. We usually have the same end goal. Like our teleological end is the same but we come at them from very different directions. Now, and now hold on. I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm, I'm just intrigued. I'm going to get in so much trouble for saying this, maybe. I'm so intrigued that, the, that a woman and a wife would go to her husband and say, help me solve this problem. Like, you actually use those words? Yeah. Yes. Wow. I think men are quite gifted at solving problems. <laughs> yes. well, yes. Good for um, you, I guess. <laughs> My bent is is towards uh, cerebral functions. Like I will like be like, here's a problem, let's fix it. I don't. Yeah. I personally don't see a point in just discussing the problem without trying to find a solution. So that might be a unique part of that. But I also want a problem solved. I don't want. Yeah, to just fair enough. Because you know, oftentimes, maybe we could even say typically, the way it, you know, the 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 idea of we need to solve this problem is sort of latent there. But it often comes with the need to just, well, I want you to listen to the problem and let's sort of, I, I just want you to affirm the problem. Mm -hmm. You tell me if this is, this, uh, I'm trying to figure this out myself. Um, I don't think I'm alone in this. Um, but it's it's just the blessed reality of, um, it's all for our sanctification. Yes. And so, you know, whatever your husband needs to become a saint, you have, and, and the same <laughs> is true with the rest of us. So I agree. Yes, I agree. And I think that Women are gifted in a way to see a variety of needs, whether they be relational, unspoken, physical, kids are screaming them at you, they're very spoken, whatever it is, and manage a lot of that at one time. And sometimes there's like an emotional taxation because yeah. of that, and you just need to kind of express it. I think that's that's part of that as well. But yes, no, if there's a problem that needs to be solved, um, to actually go and talk about it in the context of conversation. Um, and I mean, 
I don't think I mentioned this, but my kids, I had three kids in three and a half years. So the early years were a lot of little kids all in a very similar type of stage with their needs, not sleeping, different things like that, learning how we just re rightly relate, right? That's the atmosphere of a home, rightly relating to God, to each other and to our things. There's a lot of learning how to rightly relate in my house. And so with that, there are a lot of problems to be solved. And um, with habit training, you need another person to see. Now there, there have been times where I think this is a temptation. So this is the person that popped in my head for women to take the ideal of what they've had and actually allow the ideal to cause like sin in the home. And so one thing that I've thought of or difficulty, if you want to say it that way, like can cause difficulty between uh, mom and dad in the sense of like, this is, this is a personal one, screen time, something that I felt very strongly, like absolutely not terrible. We're supposed to love stories. We're supposed to be out of doors, da, 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 da. all the reasons why I could argue that this would be a terrible thing. And my husband was just saying that he wanted to have family movie night because he grew up having family movie nights and he loved them. And his family is a very healthy, very loving. They, they love being around each other. It's fun to listen to them quote half of, um, what is that football movie? Remember the Titans. They can just go on and on in their bits, right? Because they know it all so well. Um, I did not grow up in a very healthy home. I do not have a close-knit, warm family like that. And so when he would say, I really want to have family movie nights, because I was like, get rid of the TV, throw out the computers, disconnect the internet, we need books. Um, what I wasn't hearing was him saying, I want to build into the fabric of our family life something we do together together he was wanting to watch good stories. Like he was wanting to watch um, lovely examples of courage or bravery or different things together. But all I was hearing was screen time, yeah. screen, screen time. And so I think the temptation for women there is to be like double down, no, you're wrong. And I'm going to get what I want out of this. And it actually causes an atmosphere of conflict. It actually starts to cause a breakdown in the communication and your kids feed all, they eat all of that up in the atmosphere, right? And yeah. they're actually missing each other entirely because you've taken something you've taken from Mason and you've completely missed the real principle, which would yeah. be your atmosphere as an instrument, right. story right. as a way to communicate reality to children. And you've just made it like this modern no-no. And so I think that's that's one that I know I've shared in my Patreon. We actually were just discussing how to get your husband on board with habit training, educational philosophy. And this was the example I shared because it's it's a very common one when you get most of your Mason maybe from particular aesthetic on Instagram. Yeah, I, I I don't doubt that that's true. And and isn't it fascinating how, especially for those of us who are who are so driven by principles and spend a lot of time um, sort of basking in in, in the, the beauty of of the philosophical truths, let's say, and then and then you latch on to a certain practice. You're like, well this is this is the path, right? I mean the, this is obviously, you know, I've been shown the way and now Holy I need to go way. out for my, I need to leave the study here and I, I need to apply it to the household. Right. And there are actually living people out there who are like, what have you been doing in there? Right. How did, <laughs> what kind you, of mood are you in? Yes. That's right. Um, and why are you wearing yes. a tweed jacket? And it's, it's, it's not even cold yet. Um, <clears throat> but uh, exactly. no, I certainly fall into that. And um, I had a great conversation with Sean Johnson, who uh, has written for the Forma for a long time. And, and we had a conversation that primarily centered around food and film. Those are two of his great loves. Mm. And as someone who um, is interested in film, um, and, you know, I'm over here with, let's pull up the TV and grow a lot of peaches and, you know, try to find Jesus and all that sort of thing. He's saying, no, there are actually some great movies that you can watch with your family. And exactly. he has a, some lovely recommendations. And then one of the things that I, I, I really took away from, from that interview that I could apply immediately. Um, it didn't really require me to go out and buy anything, but just to change the way that we um, use the television, instead of having it um, sort of mounted in a place of prominence, like some, you know, um, you know, household God <laughs> over the hearth, right. Right. Um, you know, to actually put it away and in Sean's words, treat it like you do the iron, mm -hmm. right? And the ironing well, board, purpose. like you get it out, to yeah. iron something, and then you put it away. And it would be weird if you left your iron out all the time. Right. And I won't comment on whether I do that or not. But, <clears throat> you know, the idea is, how are you, um, are you, are you showing your children that this is something that um, we have this very intentional approach to um, versus just this sort of open portal into our lives? Mm -hmm. um, is this something that I could take out and we could watch um, you know, like the film he recommended was Ratatouille, and we were talking yeah. about food as well, um, or Wally. It was fun because he actually had movies recommendations that my kids love, 
And now I don't have to feel guilty about showing them these films because Sean Johnson, who knows what he's talking about, he so. <laughs> is very so much fine. in line with the tradition. <laughs> gave them his no, stamp I think, of approval. I think that's true. A good question that I got from Cal Newport's book, Digital Minimalism, mm -hmm. is asking, like, do I get, like, a good thing through this? So, like, if we watch a movie and we watch this particular thing, is that good? But is it the best way to get that thing? So if it's not the best way to get that thing, then right. it shouldn't be your primary way of pursuing it. So, you know, if you're using social media to keep up with friends, is that the best way to keep up with friends? No. You call them, you FaceTime them, you set up a coffee date. Getting information about their life without actually engaging in the relationship is not the best way to do that. So you can kind of start building out a framework of how you use these new modern technologies that we have in a, quote, classical way. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that definitely rhymes with um, everything else that we find within the tradition in terms of um, thinking about this this new development technology. Well, how are we going to use it? And, you know, obviously, if it gets to the point where it is causing you to sin, you should cut it off and right. you should blow it up. I mean, absolutely. You know, um, this is why I got rid of my smartphone. And I'm not saying this to impress anyone, but to impress upon people the fact that, like, I was sinning a lot. <laughs> like, yeah. I was neglecting my duties as a father and just as a servant of God because of this device. And there are other ways to do the things that I was doing on it. And I could make all sorts of excuses, like about all the wonderful podcasts I was listening to. <laughs> um, but the way I was approaching it, right? needed to be changed. And so I needed to treat it more like an ironing board um, or just get a dumb phone that kind of forced my very weak uh, willed self to do the right thing. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot to explore here. And I'm grateful that um, you're alive and working and putting out good content. And um, I hope that we can continue the conversation. And if people have questions, I want to encourage them to follow up with you um, sounds like you have a pretty vibrant Patreon community, mm, yes. and I hope to get some tips from you on that because it's something that um, I think is a great opportunity for people to come together and ask good questions, get, um, you know, very, um, let's say, um, what would be the word, almost like bestoke content, like very much catered uh, mm -hmm. to their specific needs. And then, um, you know, not only are you podcasting, but you're doing videos. So tell us about your work. And just kind of help people understand um, the various projects that you're that you're working on. Yeah. Okay. So the Commonplace is a space for new homeschooling moms or new to classical education. Homeschooling moms get their bearings in the classical Charlemagne world. That's my mission with everything that I'm doing. And so the podcast was the first thing to come out. It's my sweet baby. I love that thing. Um, we're currently in our second season. We are working through Mason's 20 principles. Um, the first season, we kind of jumped around just to get some foundational vocabulary under our belts from the classical tradition, things like the moral and mythic imaginations, things like habit training, trying to just get the wherewithal so that you could start engaging with content and understand what was being discussed. I wanted then to not be breaking things down from the start, but actually give a full picture. So in season two, we've been covering May since 20 principles and we will run from January to December. It's been a pretty good dive. Um, the podcast does come out every two weeks. And part of that is because what I produce is contended to be slow media. As we talk about how to engage with things online. Um, I don't like easy formats in which you have two seconds to engage with something. And so I have the podcast about 15 minutes. It's still short because moms have a lot going on with children underfoot, but coming out every two weeks allows you to actually think deeply on these ideas. The YouTube came out this season, and you can find me at The Commonplace there as well as a practical complementary angle to the podcast. What I found was talking about philosophy and pedagogy, which I think is the most important thing a homeschooling mom needs to have in place. So she has, you know, an anchor on that ship. She's not being tossed around um, is great. But then the next question for most moms is, but what does this really look like though? Can I just see something to kind of understand how it might play out? And so that's how the YouTube was born. And so I get a little bit more practical, take some unique angles on Mason's principles, um, and try to help a mom see how it might come to life in her home without it being prescriptive. I'm never saying copy and paste my life. Like I have zero interest on being anyone's favorite homeschool mom on the internet. In fact, most of my personal life is very private. I'm talking about principles and then giving you a couple of ideas of how it might flesh out. And then lastly would be the Commonplace Patreon. And like you said, we can go a little bit deeper. Um, we have things like a monthly Q&A where women ask questions about being mother teachers, whether that be balancing it in the midst of their other duties as homemakers, or actually what does notebooking look like in the lower forms? When do I need to use it? All sorts of things. And so there we can go 
even deeper and also hopefully have really good discussion that allow women to go out and then implement in their real lives rather than trying to build an online community where you're inward focused there. The point is to equip so you go out and you're able to continue um, educating your children and connecting with women offline. Well, I talked to a lot of homeschool moms and you're my favorite homeschool mom on the internet <laughs> thus far. So I'll update you uh, in, in the months to come if someone uh, bumps you down to second place. Thank but you. <laughs> I think you're doing great work and 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 you're really, this is kind of weird for me to admit to you, but um, like I binge watched all your videos when I found them and there were several out, but I was like, this is so wonderful that someone has actually um, sort of now I'm I'm running the risk of like inflating your ego, but you know you you have to walk a, a pretty fine line it seems to me. And tell me if I'm if I'm sort of reading the situation correctly. So you're sort of speaking to, um, well, those of us in this you know in this time of life when you know we have all these sources you know we're sort of inundated with information, but desperately seeking for knowledge. And there seems to be some some interesting trends where like a lot of uh, homeschool moms will get on and just like be very raw about the messiness of their life. And, and you know, I guess there's something to be said about that. And you have a, you know, you, you don't come across as, you know, sort of the Mary Poppins of, and I love Mary Poppins. So I love Mary. Uh, <laughs> what I mean is, you know, you don't sort of, and she kind of has, interestingly, like inside of her petticoats, I was listening to an interview with, I don't know why I'm talking about the inside of, it's late. <laughs> And here I am talking about the inside All of all the ladies' Poppins clothing tonight. <laughs> oh my gosh! What's the the actress who plays Lady Julie Andrews? Julie Andrews, thank you. She was saying that her husband, who actually did all of the costumes for that sh for that uh, movie, um, really taught her something about the character because even though she's very prim and proper on the outside, she has these wild patterns. Anytime you see like, um, and so it kind of gave her this sense of this playfulness and. I don't know if you call it naughtiness, but like this, this, you know, she's, she's got a secret. She's got, she's this mysterious woman. And, and that comes across in the way she plays the character, which she didn't necessarily get in the script. So how does that apply to you? Well, you know, what you don't do is you don't show up with like messy hair and like, you know, stained clothes, you know, like, which you probably have a lot of the time as a mom. This is just real life. Um, I bought an apron, by the way. Dad's great investment. Get an apron. Those are amazing. Um, <laughs> Wear them whenever cleaning. <laughs> and and there are prayers um, for putting on aprons, which actually, when you think about Christ donning the towel to wash his disciples' feet, I mean, to put on an apron and to think about being a servant to your family is just a it's a beautiful image. Mm -hmm. um, but you you seem to be able to walk this fine line of sort of not catering to the just kind of let it all hang out and like we're all there's something about that that just strikes me as you know, sometimes you do need to try to button things up. Like you should comb the hair out of your children's face. And, you know, like you, we should try to, you know, um, pull ourselves up and, and, and try to, um, within the messiness of life, try to bring some order to the chaos, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, you do that while at the same time, you know, seemingly being able to speak to real people um, about, um, some, you know, pretty heavy, um, ideas and practices that are going to take work. You're going to actually have to get up and, you know, get off your device and, mm -hmm. you know, get your hands dirty and, and start working this out with real people in your life. And so like, I would totally share your video with like my sister or somebody who I thought, you know, would be open to, um, receiving the wisdom that you are trying to pass on from Mason and from the tradition. D did that make any sense? I felt like it was a bit ramp. It was very generous and kind. No, I think, <laughs> I think you're, you're, yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. So what's interesting is that Mason, it's a pool quote that everyone loves that she says uh, that mothers can work wonders when they know that wonders are demanded of them or expected yeah. of them, but they pull it out of context because the next thing she says is that what she is telling moms to do is not what's easiest, but what's best for children. And so when I think about Mason, um, Mason, as a Victorian, would never allow you to be a hot mess on the internet. And I think that it is improper. There are proper times to 
to share emotions in, in proper times. Um, but I think what what is great about Mason is that the first is that you can never divorce her from love. The thing that she the things that she tells you to do will just become empty tasks. They'll become a system. And as T. S. Eliot says, men will always be dreaming of systems that are so perfect that no one has to be good. They don't actually exist, though. You can't systematize that. Um, and with Mason, though, there's this love. This, she calls it a maternal thinking love, a mother's thinking love. And when the love stays there, then you consider you continue to pursue those ideals, but they don't become idols and they don't become a burden or a weight. They just become a source of joy that you're always kind of aiming towards. And you're, you're never hitting it all the time, right? But that's why ideals are ideals. They're there so you know what you're aiming towards. And so what I try to do with the commonplace and all the arms of it is make that known that this is ultimately education is about love. Like we said, loving the right things in the right way. The way you present it to your children is about love. You're supposed to love these things. You're becoming more rightly ordered. And so when love is the heartbeat, it keeps that balance as you know best we can as sinners, but it keeps that balance between idol and burden, which an idol is a burden, but idol and ditch, I guess. And you can kind of keep moving forward. And the second thing is that Mason, she's so practical that she's almost liturgical in what she offers you. You don't know what to do. It seems like everything's a mess. Grab onto the one thing, like you said, go outside pick up a beautiful picture book, set tea and have conversation with your kids, put on a classical piece of music, whatever it is, it's just a hook you can grab onto. And so you shouldn't fall into the category of mom who can't figure out up and down. It shouldn't be a mess. Like that's not actually the vision you're giving your children. It's also not that you're so great. Like I'm not that special. The things I'm presenting to people are the wise things of, of God, the things that people ought to love and be pursuing. And that gives me a lot of freedom with the commonplace is that I am not, it's not about me. It's never going to be about me. It's always going to be about the things I'm pointing towards. And I think actually when you had Josh Gibbs on uh, maybe your second episode, he was talking about being the teacher that points. And I love that. It was the first time I had language for that. And I was like, yes, that's that's what I love about the work I do for the commonplace. And of course, the work I do in my home as the homeschooling mother is that I'm pointing at things worth noticing, worth gazing on, worth falling in love with. It's not about me. People have been pointing in those directions and will continue to point in those directions. It could be me or it could be someone else. But the things I'm offering are so lovely that I can't look away from them. Them, and hopefully the people I give it to can't look away from it. Hmm. Well, here we are, just a couple of beggars pointing to other beggars uh, where to find bread. Right. Right. Yeah. And so that that's that's a wonderful thing, and um, it's a beautiful thing to to take on. And um, I appreciate your time. And um, and uh, yeah, Miss Autumn Kern, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. We invite you to experience the art of teaching through interactive learning communities at our Patreon page. Visit patreon.com forward slash classical education. Also, be sure to join the conversation on our Facebook community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. We are a listener supported podcast, so your support makes this podcast possible. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once wrote, well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be, in a few words, this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know, best of all, what it is to behave under it, as in the presence of a Father who is in heaven. <laughs>